Hello, I believe you all do well. You all keeping safe and uh, observing all the uh, the protocols, hand washing and then uh, with soap thoroughly, sanitizing your hand every now and then, wearing a mask when you go to every uh, public country. Uh, we'll continue with our twenty fourteen uh, objective questions that we started solving. And this is the the other part of it, the continuation. Uh, so we, we, we continue from where we left off. So question twenty one: the superfly is a vector of. So when you say a vector, a vector is an organism which carries another organism that causes a disease. There's a difference between the two. The vector is a carrier of another organism that causes the disease itself. So a typical example I can give in this case is what is malaria and then mosquito. Most often, people make the assumption that malaria is caused by a mosquito. That is wrong. And normally, one of the questions that would come in an in exam where you could be asked, malaria is caused by. Now, you are likely to choose what mosquitoes, or let's say female anopsis mosquitoes. When you say that it is wrong, it is not the female anopsis mosquitoes that causes malaria. It's rather plasmodium. The plasmodium is carried inside the, or the female anopsis mosquito. So in this case, the female anopsis mosquito is the vector. Vector is a carrier. It's just a carrier. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say here. So in the same way, to catch a fly is the carrier of an organism that causes a sleeping sickness. I hope you got the difference. Now let's look at the question 22. A small metal block is 12 centimeters long, 6 centimeters high, and 4 centimeters wide. If it has a mass of 1.5 kilograms, determine its density. Now take a look. The mass is given in kilograms. However, all the answers are in grams. You see, but sometimes students will just rush. You see, this is one of the reasons why quite a number of students tend to fail in science. See, the questions are a bit tricky. Don't just go ahead. Just solving. Read the questions carefully. Carefully. I mean, uh, sometimes I say that it's almost as though <laughs> they're just finding a way not to let everybody to pass. Uh, that's that's how it appears. But uh, I mean, if you, if you have really learned or studied very well, some of these tricks wouldn't wouldn't fall prey to this trick. So this is what we do. So first, you have your formula for the, the, the finding the density of a substance. From like mass over volume, mass over volume. So now from that you could also you, you should know that volume for let's say a metal, uh, a metal block or a, a cuboid, any any object that is in the form of a cuboid or a cuboid length times breadth times height. So we are told that the block is 12 centimeters long. So that's the length. It is 4 centimeters wide. So that's the breadth or something we call it the width. And then it is 6 centimeters high so that's the height so we multiply all that through and then uh, we have 288 centimeter cube cube take note cube so uh, remember uh, take note that the three is up there it's not supposed to you don't write the three as though it's on the same line with the cm it's supposed to be up uh, a little bit above the cm all right now the mass here take note in physics one of the things you have to understand is that Certain units go with other units. Certain units they go with other units. For instance, gram goes with centimeters. Take note. And then kilogram goes with what? Meters. So if you have been given the mass in kilogram, the volume is now in centimeter cube. They don't go together. Kilogram and centimeter cube don't go together. So if you just put the values together, it fits in. You are going to get it wrong. All right. So. Density is called to mass over volume. Mass is given as 1.5 kilogram. So we change it to gram. So that now the gram now goes with the cm cube, the centimeter. So 1.5 kilogram will give us 1,500 grams. How? Because every for one kilogram, you have about 1,000 gram. Or 1,000 gram makes one kilogram. So if 1,000 gram makes one kilogram, then how many grams is going to give you 1.5? Kilograms, so thousand thousand five hundred. 
So density is equal to mass over volume. So 1,500 grams over 288 cfp. So I'll say this again. If you use the 1.5 divided by 288, you might, you might get an answer all right. The truth is that when you get the answer, it is likely that the answer will be part of the possible answers. You see, so this, these are just some of the tricks that, uh, that students uh, find themselves victims. And then they think that they did so well in the exam, but when the results comes in, and then there is a, there's a massive failure. So let's check that. Very important. So you change it to... The, the units must always go together. If it's gram, it has to go in centimeters. So the question is, they've given you kilogram. The other side is centimeters. You have to change one. You have to change the kilogram to gram. Or you change the centimeter to meter. So that the meter goes to the kilogram. Okay, so that gives you 5.2 gram per cmp. So that's 17. It's a damage to the brain and spinal cord. Are usually permanent and irreversible because damaged nerve cells never heal. So these cells in the body, that's what is on the, the far right on the slide. That's a nerve cell. So a nerve cell is a special type of cell. So normally it's part of what is called a specialized cell. The name itself too. In other words, you don't have any cell in the body which is like this cell. It's a, it's a specialized cell, meaning it has special structures. It has specific functions, special functions that it plays. That's why we call it a specialized cell. So, for instance, sperm cell. Sperm cell, like, there's no cell in the body anywhere that is like the sperm cell. They are specialized or they are special, in quotes, unique. The specialized cells are unique cells having unique features, performing specific functions. Sperm cell, egg cell, all of them are unique cells. So, so that's the nerve cell. Now, when nerve cells are damaged, that is it. They don't, they don't, they cannot be repaired. They cannot be repaired. So because like, if somebody has an injury to the brain and then and remember that the brain and then the spinal cord they make up what you call the central nervous system. And these these are all made up of what nerve cells. Central nervous the nervous system is basically made up of nerve cells. It's the nerve cells that come together, organize into various parts and form the nervous system. And then we have the peripheral nervous system which is made up of uh, the nerve. The nerve. So when this normally this can occur if you have let's say an injury where you hit your head against something. When you hit your head against something, it could it could it could lead to damage of some of the nerve cells in your brain. When that happens, it's either maybe you could have memory loss or you could have damage to certain parts of your body. You get paralyzed, especially if your neck. If maybe you fall from a story building and it hits and then your neck, you 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 get an injury over there. It's likely that it wouldn't heal. Uh, I think that there was one famous actor, is it Christopher Reeves, Superman or so, who, who, who got the same injury. He got an injury to uh, around the spinal cord area. Yeah, so he got paralyzed. He couldn't work because, you know, they, they control the spinal cord, controls uh, our movement, movement of our hand. So when there's a problem over there, they can't move your hand anymore. Now, 24, the following graphics are constituents of air, except for soft. Sulfur is not a natural constituent of air. Air, air as you can see in the illustration, air is the major and abundant gas found in air is of nitrogen, 78%, followed by oxygen, 20.9, or sometimes 21%, and then followed by carbon dioxide, which is 0.03%. Then the other gases put together would also form the remaining, but take no sulfur is not part. So we have carbon dioxide, we have nitrogen, which is the most abundant gas in air. Take note, it's just one of the questions that they normally ask. Which gas is the most abundant in air? It is nitrogen. Okay, now 25. The difficulty encountered by kids in losing body heat through perspiration could be overcome by us providing fresh clean water in the sun. Providing fresh clean water in the sun. Now this is a regular reflection of light, okay? So the reflector is over. So regular reflect, so you have the diagram which is show you regular reflected type of reflection, the, the rays coming, uh, falling on the mirror, uh, we call that the incident ray. They, they, are, they will be reflected in the same direction and at the same angle. So take note of these two things. In the same direction and at the same angle. Maybe in section B it could be as ah, also regular reflection. So regular reflection refers to 
type of reflection is a reflected wave out are reflected at the same angle and in the same direction. So you see that the reflection is, is, is perfect like it. It's okay and it normally occurs on smooth surfaces like or like a plain mirror shiny surfaces. That's when you have a regular reflection. But when a surface is for instance rough then of course the incident rays are going to be scattered so they are not going to reflect it in the same or direction so we are going to have what we call a diffuse reflection sometimes we call it irregular reflection in other words the reflection is not regular it's not ordered it's diffuse it's scattered scattered reflection and that occurs on a rough surface and like a wall you might think that a wall is very smooth but it isn't that smooth if a wall was very smooth you you should have regular reflection occurring on it so what it means is that if you should look at a wall you should see your face but the reason why you don't see your face on a wall is because it is what it's red uh, sorry irregular or diffuse reflection occurring so you have what the, the reflector is scattering so there's no proper formation of image but if you have a smooth surface like a mirror there is regular reflection that's how come your image forms so well perfectly so nicely on it that you are able to see yourself now take your black surfaces do not reflect they rather absorb that's why it wouldn't be a the smooth fine smooth would reflect but black surfaces normally would absorb light rays that's why it's not advisable to wear black uh, clothing um, during uh, sunny weather conditions because you're going to absorb so much heat and then you're so uncomfortable. The main advantage of sexual reproduction of asexual reproduction is that sexual reproduction is what? Now, let's understand sexual reproduction is a type of reproduction in which there is fusion of both male sex cell and the female sex cell together to form a zygote. Or, I can say that sexual reproduction involves two people or two individuals. And then we have what's called the asexual reproduction. That one involves just one person. So, you know, reproduction is a way which living organisms or they produce new offspring or new young ones after their own kind. But there are two types. You see that you have a parent produce another offspring all by him, itself. Or you have two parents coming together to produce another offspring because the two merge together or they, they fuse when they are sex they are they are they are sex health. So reproduction is of two types. It's either it's one person. Maybe some someone might be asking how how would reproduction involve just one individual? Of course for humans we don't undergo asexual reproduction because for humans for you to produce a baby you need a male and a female. So that's a sexual sexual reproduction involving two individuals. But for asexual reproduction, it involves just one what individual, and that's that, that's what is seen in a, a plant like cassava. If you want to produce another cassava plant, you just cut a part of it, you put it inside the ground, it gives you another one. You don't need to go and take male cassava, female cassava, and join them. No, there's nothing like that. So that that's what I'm trying to drive at. And some bacteria are also like yeast, all these organisms which also undergo asexual reproduction. In other words, you don't have female yeast, male yeast, or female bacteria, male bacteria, then they come together and then uh, meet as it were. No, they don't do that. They can just reproduce another offspring of their own. So now, if you look at this, you realize that sexual reproduction, because you are involving two people, two individuals, there will be more variation. Variation means that there will be more. Uh, variety, variety in character as compared to asexual reproduction. So because asexual reproduction, assuming there's a plant and then you, you just you just replant it. You cut a portion of the plant, like sugar cane, you replant it. The same way, the same tip of the sugar cane, you get it from the new sugar cane plant. Because it's just one individual. But if it involves two individual, one person will bring his or her character. Another one will bring another character. Then they combine that together, then they give a different variety. So in effect, sexual reproduction has the advantage of bringing about a variation. Or they will give you uh, uh, characters which are desirable traits or desirable characters as compared to asexual reproduction. Now, 
Now, maize is a cereal. Maize is a cereal because of it has a narrow lead. Yes, so that's it. So, maize is a cereal because it has a narrow lead. But it is one of the following pair of elements can combine to form an ionic compound. So, an ionic compound is formed between, take note of the word, ionic compound. Now, a compound is what? A chemical combination between or two or more substances or two or more different elements. Now, an ionic compound, just like the word itself, ionic, meaning compound form from what? Ion. Now, what is an ion? An ion is what? It's uh, an electrically charged charge particle. It could either be a positively charged particle or a negatively charged particle. When it's a positively charged particle, we call it a cation that has positive charges. When it is negatively charged, we call it an ion uh, with, a, yeah, with a negative charge. Now, so when these two, these two ions, positive ions, cation, negative ions, and ions come together, they form an ionic compound. So a typical example is what we have on the slide. So you have a, a sodium ion, which is a cation, positive ion. Then you have a chloride ion, which is a negative ion, an ion. They come together and then they form a sodium chloride. That's a table salt, normal salt, which is an ionic or compound. It's an ionic compound. So it tells you that an ionic compound is formed between a cation and then an anion. It cannot be formed between two cations. Now take note, cations are normally formed from metals. Metals like the ion, 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 sodium, potassium, magnesium. Those are the ones that form cations. And most of the, I'm not saying all of them, but the rest of them are mostly anions. Oxygen, uh, chlorine, sulfur, all these would form what anions carry negative charges. All right, so so if you take the first, uh, the A is C and O, that is wrong. Those carbon and oxygen, the symbol of carbon oxygen, carbon and oxygen are all anions. You know, so they don't end with ion, ion. They are not metals, so they all form anions. So that they can't form an ionic compound. Take note, I'll say it again. An ionic compound is formed between what? Cation and then what? Anion. A positive ion and then a negative ion. Now, the B2, you have aluminium and magnesium, two ions. So, meaning the two of them are metals. Take note, that cannot be formed. That cannot form an ionic compound. An ionic compound is formed between what? A metal and then a non metal. Or a cation and then what? An anion. Now, hydrogen and sulfur. The two of them are all non metals or anions. Then D, we have copper and oxygen. Copper is a metal. Copper is a metal, although that's the end of the ion. So I said that most of the metals, most of them, not all of them, most of them are the end in the end ion. But some of them do not. Gold is a metal, but it doesn't end in ion. Copper, yes. Uh, so quite a number of them. Ion. Yeah, so copper and oxygen would form an ionic compound. Now let's take note of that. Step, which of the following characteristics can be used to distinguish between the same note played on a piano and an organ? All right, so if you look at the illustration here, so the first one, you know, sound, as it were, sound is a wave. So that's a wave diagram here. Now, if you look at the first one, the first one is a wave or a sound produced from what? From a bass guitar. Now, look at the way, look at the way the, the lines are. Now, so we call those lines, as it were, we call them uh, waves. We call them waves. Now, the distance from one crest, crest is the top, well, like from one top to another top, is called a wavelength. This is one of the questions that you could be asked in section B. What is a wavelength? So a wavelength is or the successive distance between two what uh, is, is the distance between two successive crests. Crest is the top, the top, the, the peak. That's what I'm referring to as what the crest. Or you could say you could use a down one. Or a wavelength is the distance between two successive or throw T R O U G H. Throw is a the under, those are the base. Yes, so that gives you uh, a full what wavelength. Now, when you compare the the wavelength 
of the top one that's the the sound produced from the bass guitar the pitch from the bass guitar and then the pitch from a whistle you realize that the wavelength of the top one is long it's longer as compared to the wavelength of the whistle okay so how does this affect the sound it affects the sound by making it the wavelength is so long the pitch is low meaning it's not the sound is not that high like the pitch is low but when the wavelength is smaller then the pitch becomes what higher so you see, so if you compare a bass guitar if you if you play a bass guitar and then a whistle you see this the whistle will sound higher high pitch because of what because of the short wavelength and also there's also another principle we call it frequency frequency is the number of what wavelength in a, a second so if you look at this diagram you have one millisecond duration so the number of what take to the it could also be exact what is frequency frequency is the number of what cycles or the number of wavelengths uh, covered by a wave per, per, per period time per unit period so here yeah, you realize that the frequency of the top one is, is lower as compared to the frequency from the whistle the sound blows a bit so the higher the frequency the higher the pitch the higher the frequency the higher the pitch you know in the layman's the frequency is like how often something occurs so realize that the down one is it's the wave is occurring more frequently so it has a high frequency the top one the wave occurs less frequently it has a low frequency so you have a, a low pitch so the one way that you could distinguish between the same note played on a piano and then an organ is by using what the pitch one would be of high pitch one would be of what low pitch on the relative proportions of various particle size in a given color sample is called the texture. Take note. Take note. Now, as, as I said, it could also be asked in case in Hebrew, it could be asked what is soil texture. It is what the relative proportion of the various particle sizes of soil, yes, particle sizes in a, in a given color sample. Why? Because some of them are just like the, the illustration here. So, sun particle has a, has a higher size, the bigger size. So sand particles are huge. That's how can water can drain through easily. So there is so much air space in between them. Then you have uh, clay is the least. Clay has the smallest uh, soil particle size. So they are able to come closer together more. So there is little air in between what clay particles. So they tend to trap in water in between them. So we're going to see an object is placed between a converging lens. And then its principal focus. A police an image is always what? Z rex spectral rail or magnified. So we have a converging lens. So a converging lens is a lens that would would, would converge an image, will make an image to meet at a point. That's a converging lens. Or we could call that so that's that so that's a converging lens on the diagram on the illustration. So a word sort of bring the image together and cause the it will focus the light rays at a point to meet. At the point now the principal focus of any lens is where the light rays after they have been refracted through the lens the path of the lens that's where they meet the principal focus is where they meet okay so over here you see that we are saying that if you place the object in between the principal focus which is f represented by f in the illustration and then the converging lens which is also the drawn with it yeah so that's it you would see that it would form an image which would appear larger it's a virtual image that that's is 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 represented in the short dashes with the arrow on top so you see that the virtual image is bigger than the object so it is magnified if it's bigger than it's magnified now because because of the short dashes you know it appears to what to meet behind the object now, whenever you have an image formed as a result of what rays appearing to meet, like the way it is in mirrors, play mirrors, a virtual image is formed. So I'll come again. This is one of the questions that you could also have difference between a virtual image and a real image. A real image is formed by all the actual, the real, that's what it's called real, but you don't use the real in your definition. A real image is formed by all the actual intersection of what light rays. But uh, uh, a virtual image is formed by, by the 
apparent manifestation of light rays in the system. So it appears to be, or it appears to have come from that, but uh, that is that. So that produces a, a virtual image. So it will be virtual. It will be erect. Erect means it's standing straight. It's not inverted. It's not turned upside down. You still see that the arrow is upright. So it tells you that. So, so it is erect, virtual, and it is magnified. It's magnified. So that is what C. It is not real. It cannot be virtual and real at the same time. Normally, real images are inverted. They turn upside down. Okay. That's why if you look, if you look at your face and you see a mirror. The image you see is a virtual image. That is why it is erect. Virtual images are also erect. But real images tend to be uh, turned outside or inverted. So look at the following bones from the axial skeleton in mammal. So the axial skeleton in mammal is formed from the skull. So that's what is shown by the pink and colour illustration. So the skull is part of it. And then you also have uh, the ribs and then the sternum, they form the they form the axial skeleton. They form the axial skeleton. All right. <laughs> now let's move on. So, so for the original formula for our change, it was C and H two N plus C, C and H two N plus or C. Yes, as for this one, we can have the manifestation that is a formula, formula for, for general formula for our team. So, okay, an example of an team is K, E, C, A, C, N, E. So, N can represent any number. So, 1, if, if it's 1 there, uh, so you have C, H, then 2 multiplied by 1 plus C, so that will be 4. So, you have C, H, 4. We call that methane. So, methane is an alkane. Transition of incompatible blood process may lead to a formation of blood clot. In other words, if, uh, if you are doing blood transfusion, means if you are giving donating blood to someone who is in need of life, and they don't check their blood group, <coughs> and then it is incompatible, uh, meaning they don't match. That's it. You are going to form blood clot, and it's very dangerous. Look at the picture here. When blood clot forms. This is what someone saying the, the red blood cells will come together, they will clump together and they can block some of the veins, some of the arteries, the vessels. They can block them from supplying or blood to let's say the heart or some of them and then it could cause death. Now policies aim at conserving natural resources to ensure that so, the resources to sustain the present are properly managed. And it's very important. So these policies policies to uh, about galamsey and all that, it, it should ensure that we conserve our natural resources, our trees, the, the river bodies, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be polluted. Those coming after us, we have to think about them. So every policy that is against galamsey should take into consideration all these things. Those who will come after us, if they come and then the water bodies are polluted, where are they going to get their water sources from? And if the trees are all cut down, vegetation is destroyed. It will lead to global warming and all that, and they are going to really suffer. So that is that. So tell said which of the following source can cause temporary hardness of water. So that is what the calcium hydrogen carbonate. Normally, the hydrogen carbonate, once they age, the carbonate, they they form the temporary hardness of water. We have the permanent hardness of water. So that one is caused by the sulfates, by the calcium sulfate, iron sulfate. They form the 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 permanent hardness of water. No hardness of water is when water is not it's a type of hard water is a type of water which does not lack are easily restored. Why? Because of the presence of certain ions, such as hydrogen carbonate, sulfate, and the rest. They, they make the water not to lack are easily restored. And so when you are using hard water, they tend to waste a lot of water. So let's see the system for the two bodies depends on the, the nature of the surfaces of the bodies in contact. So that if the surface, the two surfaces in contact are very smooth, the Frictional force is less, but if they are rough, the frictional force is more. Mercury is used as a thermometer liquid because it, it does not refine. So it, it's so important because if you put, if you have a, a liquid which is inside a thermometer and then let's say at a temperature of about 30 degrees Celsius, then it starts to boil and evaporate. 
and your normal body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. So it means that if you should use this on a human being, uh, it wouldn't even reach the normal temperature, and then it starts to boil. You can't read it. You should just evaporate and then leave the thermometer or go and condense somewhere inside the thermometer. But mercury can be used because mercury does not vaporize uh, easily. Does not vaporize easily. Remember, mercury is a metal. A metal tends to have higher uh, boiling point than melting point. The skin of a mammal is full of salt and water, oil. Alright, so thank you. We'll continue later.